I should have mentioned at the very beginning that one of the reasons why this group of people is very appropriate is that all have a background in, a, in civil rights and in working in human rights uh, throughout their careers. Uh, so we're delighted that all three have shown such a commitment. Um, our, our third keynote speaker is Senator Catherine Zipone. Um The Senator's um, record in her tireless work for human rights and her, her complete effort to bring in marriage equality for Ireland. Um, we are hugely in her debt in terms of being a leader in this area. So uh, we're delighted to have her with us today. So Senator great pleasure to be here uh, this morning and to share um, uh, this time uh, with the minister and, and also Michael. And again, congratulations for to, to, to uh, Tenny Transgender Europe uh, for gathering us all together here. It's a hugely historic moment. Um, <clears throat> it's always a privilege for me to also follow my um, to follow my colleague and great friend uh, Michael, uh, and I think we uh, are take to heart uh, all that he has done to lay out the issues as uh, seen here in Ireland. I also must say that, and I rec recognize uh, and acknowledge with him, it's important uh, to have this democratic dialogue and uh, for people to register their concerns uh, in terms of the issues that the minister has raised. But I must say that I did take part uh, myself from the words uh, of the minister. I'm going to be offering some strong words in a moment in terms of where we are, but I did take heart from your words, minister, um, I suppose, especially because you began with, it is about identity. And I do believe, I, from the way she described it, she does have a sense of the importance of people being able to be who they are. And I also want to acknowledge when you said to the responsibility of lawmakers, and that's largely what I'm going to be speaking about, it is our responsibility. And finally, your acknowledgement too of how, um, how much uh, the country wants to embrace and move on with change. So, humanity in the 21st century and I too want to call for trans rights now as your that is the theme of your conference and one of the primary challenges of the 21st century I think is for lawmakers to catch up with how humans are living their lives indeed wouldn't it be visionary if lawmakers might think about their job as making law that embraces the full continuum of humanity so that no one person is shamed by law, or shamed by the lack of law, such that she, he, yo, ye, see, or they, <laughs> hide from who they are. Or from, as, as I was said, as I was told by a young uh, tr a trans boy, Danny, who met with me in, in Leicester House uh, recently with some other colleagues, to hide from who they are or the inside of me, the core of me. Now, of course, many trans people are not ashamed. Many trans people have moved through fear. You, you are so many of those among us. That, fret, that move through fear and to take that frightening, oftentimes dangerous journey of simply becoming who you are. And as Margaret Wheatley, a great leader for progressive change has said, fear is fundamental to being human, so we can expect that we'll feel afraid at times, perhaps even frequently. But what is important to notice is what we do with our fear. We can withdraw or distract or numb ourselves. Or we can recognize the fear and then step forward anyway. Fearlessness simply means that we do not give fear the power to silence or stop us. And so, because so many trans people have not withdrawn, so many of you who are present here today, so many trans people have embraced and celebrated your humanity. You place a challenge at the door of every lawmaker who resides within a jurisdiction that hides 
from humanity. This is an image from a book by Professor Martha Nussbaum, a lawyer, an ethician, a philosopher, who's written about how much of, there's a lot of law that embeds shame and disgust, and as consequently, people then can hide from humanity. But what would it mean, and I think it's a very powerful image, this is why I brought it here, for political representatives to change law or to create new law that does not perpetuate a society that hides from humanity? It would mean to change law that embeds shame and disgust for some humans and not others. It would mean to create law that protects all citizens from insults to their dignity. The minister spoke a lot about dignity, as did Michael. It would mean to remove stigma from former or current social groups that are marginalized. And it would mean, I think, that law takes up its right proper and honorable function to protect all citizens in areas essential to the individual humanity. Lawmakers and political representatives would have to re-examine social norms contained within law and public policy. They would have to ask and answer the question, and that's what we need to do in the, in the committee, um, and then when it comes to uh, the houses of the Oireachtas, what is ethical law for trans people? Indeed, in doing this, lawmakers would necessarily be re-examining the function of law. Your rights movement requires that lawmakers do that. So what is the function of law? Should it simply embed existing emotional or social norms? Or should it, as Professor Nussbaum puts, should law itself be normative, playing a dynamic and educational role, helping to shape the society that we want to become. Uh, I think that we need law that protects its citizens from shaming. What does shame feel like? Well, I know something about what shame feels like because my sexual identity didn't fit within an exclusive or excluding heterosexual norm as I was growing up. And although Irish society and other societies have gone a long distance to normalize homosexuality and homosexual identity through law and policy, some people still don't get it. Like the man I met the other day when I introduced to him my life partner and spouse, Anne Louise Gilligan, and he looked through me. Then he looked away from me. I know some of you have I've had that experience. So, but what is needed now um, to move on then? What is needed now to embrace humanity? We need law. We need law that is purged of shaming people who do not conform to the gender binary norm and law that counters transphobic disgust. We need. We need law that supports human freedom and space for human creativity. And we need law, and this, this type of law will necessarily then, I think, support the creation of decent material conditions of life for all. So we, I'm going to keep going. We need to embrace so humanity. In terms of embracing humanity, what the first point I'm going to be making here is that we need your advocacy. We need trans advocacy. We need you as leaders. And I have two beautiful photographs of Dr. Lydia Foy and also Ms. Louise Hannon, who's also taken a case here in relation to Ireland. to embrace humanity. We need your advocacy. The second thing we need is to use the Yoga Karta principles. To embrace humanity, the lawmakers need to be attentive to these principles. As many of you know, they were developed in 2007. That's five years ago by international human rights experts. Five years ago then, they, they reflected the existing state of international human rights law in relation to sexual orientation and gender identity. And these principles are intended to act as an interpretive aid to human rights treaties and conventions. And they, but they also recognize that states may incur additional obligations as human rights laws continue to evolve and as human rights and, and as a human rights-based approach to lawmaking becomes hopefully a hallmark of the 
first century. The Yogyakarta principles, and I'm just going to quote the one that I think is really critical here, principle three, each person's self-defined sexual orientation and gender identity is integral to their personality and is one of the most basic aspects of self-determination dignity, and freedom. And these principles are beginning to become embedded in the lawmaking throughout Europe and other jurisdictions. The third thing we need, I think, to make law that embraces humanity is to refer to, to take on the authoritative reports and recommendations and guidelines that are coming out now subsequent to the Yoga Karta principles that complement them. Um, and that, it, that I suppose uh, fulfill you know, the, the principle's own forecast that these issues are evolving. And as with the principles, these reports um, uh, from the European Commission, from, uh, from, from ILG Europe, uh, also um, from uh, the commissioner, EU Commissioner on Human Rights, are, are ethical signposts. And they remind us that we must legislate in ways that future-proof our laws. We must not always be catching up with how humans live their lives. It's clear, I think, from many of the authoritative recommendations in this area that lawmaking is moving in the direction of a rights-based model for gender recognition. But what would that look like, a rights-based model for gender recognition? Well, I think the first thing, it would, what, what, what would have to be included in a rights-based model for gender recognition, I think, would to move beyond um, to move beyond a requirement for an, a, a, a diagnosis of a mental disorder in order to achieve one's gender recognition in law. Trans voices in Ireland, just some of the words. Because the, the language is evolving. We need your evolving language to help us grow in our awareness and, and, and education, as the minister referred to. I've also then been just speaking about what's needed, the trans advocacy, the use of principles, these authoritative recommendations. And then I'm the, the, the last thing I think, uh, I, and when I talked about that third point, I, I, you know, and I know there's a lot of technical detail there, especially as the, um, as the uh, uh, you know, this, this is a long name for this manual, the statistical manual, you know the one, I mean, the DSM, yeah. the fifth edition, maybe getting rid of gender identity disorder. Yeah. Yeah. At the same time, we need to, and just to conclude that, we, the questions we need to raise in relation to that is should law, should law demand that individuals fulfill the medical requirements of that body that puts out that manual, which is the American Psychiatric Association, should law demand that, in, should law demand that individuals fulfill medical requirements of the body in order to gain access uh, to basic legal rights? Should access to legal rights be dependent on these debated uh, terms, GID, gender dysphoria? I think we need to raise these kinds of questions if we're legislating in line with a human rights-based approach. And I suggest that access to legal rights, as I've said then, does, should not be dependent on achieving a diagnosis of mental illness, nor should it be dependent on undergoing medical treatments that are not desired by individuals. Such requirements... to self-determination. They stigmatize and they infringe the dignity of trans people, and lawmakers need to know that. Um, finally, then, we need to, I think, in order to embrace humanity, we need to make reference to law that incorporates best practice 
Um, uh, if, if we're to embrace humanity, this will maximize the potential for the best outcome. Legislating for gender recognition of trans people may seem like a hugely complex and cumbersome legal minefield. And it is complex, and it, we have to do it in the context of the Constitution here. And now I'm going to say a little bit about Ireland in a moment, as, as the Minister has already indicated. But I know many of you aware are of the law, the, what you would consider to be the law of best practice that's come out, particularly in relation to Argentina, where a simple answer has been given. Because it became a world leader in gender recognition because, and it introduced the most expeditious and transparent recognition process yet. Once the lawmaking process was purged of transphobic assumptions and discomfort or disgust with gender variance, what's been produced is a model that provides real protection and real recognition for people uh, who, of avail, who of, of avail of it, I think. And, and it, it's a law that does not require a diagnosis of a mental illness in order to access a legal right, nor does it require that medical intervention takes place. It includes a broadly defined non-medical definition of gender identity and gender expression. And it should be noted, too, that a person's marital status is not among the requirements under Argentina's legislation. Argentina is proud of both its progressive gender recognition legislation and the fact that it's provided marriage equality in 2010. So what, just to, to conclude then, how will we, and we're all three of us are, are taking a look at this issue of how will we embrace humanity here in Ireland, and I just have a few more words, but as I'm speaking those words, I want to put before you some of our people here, our leaders, our people who come out. If Ireland introduces legislation that incorporates a forced divorce clause requiring an individual to choose between their family and their identity, and the ministers referred to this, I think we will ine inevitably see more legal challenges costing more money to the state. But not only that, we will see more individuals and families who are forced to seek recourse through the courts because the legislation is inadequate or not fit for purpose. It is worth remembering that we in Ireland do not have a Supreme Court interpretation of our Constitution which excludes the right of same-sex couples to marry. My partner and Liz and I, Gill uh, Gilligan and I, are seeking that. We do not have an authoritative Supreme Court interpretation of our Constitution that says that same-sex couples are excluded from marriage. So that's important to put out there. Um, in other jurisdictions, even where that is the case, the courts are, are making decisions, both Germany and Austria, uh, where they are separating those two rights to gender recognition and the right to marry. And I think in Ireland, as we uh, uh, as we review and finally make our law for gender recognition, we need to be conscious of and the importance of keeping those rights separate. So if we are to truly embrace all of our beautiful and diverse humanity, I think Ireland is it's important for us and in other countries that trans advocacy is there, um, that we refer to the, uh, the Yogacarta principles, the new reports that are coming out, and also best practice law. <laughs> And we should not make law that does not do this. We must ensure that our gender recognition legislation does not violate the basic human rights of our people, that it does not degrade people or infringe on their dignity, that it does not remove their autonomy or self-determination. We need to embrace humanity. And we need to embrace humanity now in Ireland, the full humanity in Ireland now. We have the principles, the court's decisions, the laws made in other jurisdictions. The humanity of trans people demands legal recognition. Anything less would be the wrong thing to do.